Welcome to the latest I House in Conversation with. Uh, today I'm delighted I'm in conversation with the uh, current president of ARLA, Maxine Fothergill. So, Maxine, welcome. welcome. Thank you. I say welcome, we're actually in your offices, aren't we? We so. are indeed, yes. yes. <laughs> so, you know, it should be you welcoming me, but anyway. Um, Maxine, I've known you a long time. You've got, you've got a background, you're a landlord, you're a letting agent, you do block management, you do training. You do councillor, uh, as in the local authority, and you do EPC assessments as well. Do you ever go to sleep, or do you just, you know? <laughs> so you're all president of ARLA. ARLA, I know, has been around for a long time, been around since 1981. Actually started in my part of the woods, in sort of in Kent. It's, it's, yeah. um, and one of the originators of it is still knocking around, uh, Francis Birkinshaw. That's correct. There's a name from the past for you, so, so she's been around for a while. Can you explain to me the difference between ARLA, Property Mark and NAEA? Because I get a bit confused about all of that. Property Mark is the big umbrella. Right. Um, and underneath Property Mark are the different disciplines. So you've got ARLA, which is obviously the letting side of the business. Okay. And then you've got NAEA, which is the sales side. And then you've got NAVA, which is the... Um, auction side of the business oh, right. okay. and then you've also got Arla Inventories which is the inventory, <laughs> inventory size of the business so uh, yeah there's it's um, sort of broken up into all the different divisions yep. um, but Property Mark is the main umbrella where the different divisions all sit below. Right and you're this year's president of? Of Arla. Of Arla. Yes. Okay and uh, have you got equivalent presidents in NAEA and the others? We have indeed. Oh, right, okay. um, there are equivalent uh, to myself for the NAEA side, that is Liana, yeah. um, who's uh, the president this year for the sales side. Okay. And then there's Paul from Clive Emsons, and right. he is the equivalent on the NAVA side, on okay. the auctioneering side. And again, we've known Emsons, we know Clive. Absolutely, for, for a for very many, long time. Many years, so, yeah. Yes, yes, good, good old. So, so it's all really down in Kent this year. It is, <laughs> it does seem to be, yes. Well, Kent rules the world, you know that by now, quite honestly. <laughs> um, but I know with, with Arla that you, you expect agents to be trained to a certain level before they can, before they can practice. Mm. So just tell me quickly about the, the different levels of training and what it is they go through. Okay. Um, at the moment, Peter, it's, as you know, it's a really unregulated mm. industry and it is a concern because, well, as you're aware, you know, Arla is actually a, a, a good old trade name. It's been around for since 1981 <laughs> um, and it's always had that bar to entry. You know, people need to actually like, know what they're doing, they need mm -hmm. to get their qualifications. Um, and they need to have actually set up proper businesses. Yep. Um, but it's an unregulated industry. Yep. Okay, so, um, yeah, level of qualifications is that you need to be set up as a proper business. Um, you need to have actually um, been trading, so you need to have actually know what you're doing to get your qualifications. Um, as a business owner, you've got to have actually got your qualifications. Yep. So we've always set the bar quite high as far as Arla is concerned. Yep. Um, and, you know, thanks to Francis and the team many years ago, you know, that has been um, the way it is. And, and we've actually been quite a respected industry. Um, but unfortunately, it is an unregulated mm -hmm. industry. And uh, as you know, anybody can go along, buy a manual off of, I don't know, the internet somewhere, mm. um, read a book, and then suddenly set themselves up. And all they need to do, legitimately and legally, is to set up a, a is to join an ombudsman. Um, yep. And we know many aren't even doing that. Yes, yes, we're aware of that. Yeah. So just just briefly to explain that, to, for all agents must belong to an ombudsman. There's only two, mm. um, and also have client money protection. And that's all they have at the moment. Yes, that's right. Uh, we, as a, a landlord association, have been pushing for some time for more regulation for agents and for landlords. Mm -hmm. I have to say, we'll come on to that in a minute. Um, so we're quite pleased about that. Now, I know you had quite a lot to do with, or Arla had quite a lot to do with um, the Roper Report, which is done by Lord Richard Best. We've known Richard for quite some time. Mm -hmm. uh, we've all done quite a bit of work with him over the years. Um, he, he's an independent, he's a cross-bench 
uh, Lord, um, but he does do a lot of work. Now, what's your views of the Roper Report? Oh, I'm delighted by it, to be totally honest. It's one of these things where, you know, I've just mentioned back to you, um, I have been campaigning for regulation for many, many years because it is an unregulated industry, because there are very bad agents out there that we're aware of, mm -hmm. and anyone can do it, and there doesn't seem to be any kind of like recourse, mm -hmm. or very little, and especially if they don't bother to join a, an ombudsman or a, a CPM scheme or mm -hmm. anything, and they can, and they yep. get, you know, they're there, mm -hmm. and they are under the radar, and unless they're caught out, they'll continue to be. So for me, when all of this came about, I was delighted that we got a seat round the table yep. with Lord Best um, and many other industry professionals to be able to actually try and shape the future. Now, as you know, unfortunately, we've gone through a pandemic. Um, I think that um, the work that Lord Best did after it was actually commissioned was brilliant. We were all looking forward to actually something happening and then COVID mm. happened. Yeah, so, so I'm delighted to tell you that MHCLG have actually now put in provisions for um, somebody new who's going to be actually working on regulation. Okay. So I think the good work that Lord Best actually did yeah. is definitely coming back on the table. Yeah. Watch that. Watch this space. Well, I know he's been pushing in the background, isn't he? Oh, to, to make sure the Ministry yes. don't forget the work that they've done. Yes. And as you say, uh, the problem is it is unregulated. Mm. Um, and it's just we, we as a landlord association get some of our members saying uh, you know my uh, my agent isn't doing what I'm supposed to be doing also I do say I do stress and we, we we both trainers and I know when I'm training landlords I say to them absolutely no problems with using an agent but a make sure they're regulated to belong to R or someone like that um, but b uh, make sure that they, they actually do know what they're talking about and make sure You've got a good contract between the owner and the agent. I actually personally think that's the most important bit of paper in the lettings industry. Yes, definitely. Because, yeah. again, we get questions on the helpline along the lines of, my agent's not doing X, Y, Z, what, what should happen? And the immediate answer is, well, are they contracted to do X, Y, Z? Mm -hmm. Whatever X, Y, Z is. Yes, yeah. And I you, must, as, a, as an agent, yeah. now with your agent's hat on, yeah. rather than your other hat on, you must get this as well. You must get people expecting you to do things you're not contracted to do. So. Oh, all the time, all yeah. the time. Um, and that's one thing I will say to, to your members, it is really important mm. when you are engaging anybody, you know, but especially if you're engaging an agent, um, one, make sure that they are a proper regulated agent, ideally an ARLA agent. Um, so <laughs> say know, that quick to the camera. <laughs> yeah, please use ARLA agents. <laughs> um, and uh, secondly, um, do make sure that you read what you're actually signing yeah. for. Um, yeah. You need to read your terms and conditions. If there's something in there that you you, know, you don't like, then you need to talk to the agent. Yeah. And I, think, I find with the smaller independents, you've got your landlords will have a lot more leverage yeah. so they will be able to say well actually I'm not keen on, on that bit of you know you know that certain section yeah. and can we do something about that um, smaller independent agents have obviously got a lot more leverage they can actually make changes the large corporates might not be able to do so so that is something to bear in mind yeah but again, we, we sometimes get members on who say, my agent won't change the contract. And our answer is, find a new agent. Absolutely. Because quite yes. frankly, all contracts are negotiable. Yes, yeah. And I, if, they, if they really say that, I can't change it. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And even with the, the large corporates, you know, if yeah. they can't go back to somebody yeah. and actually say, you know, this landlord is going to be a really good landlord and what can we do? Then I think that there's something fundamentally wrong. So yeah. yes, you know, I would agree with you. Yeah, I'm going to stress this because I'm sorry to go on about it, but it's just we get it so much on the helpline. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we do get on the helpline, which has come up a few times, has come up recently as well, are um, landlords who are locked in. So they've, they've locked into an agent who's done a find only and they're having to continue paying a fee while that tenant's in there. Really? Now yep. this goes back to the Foxton's case. Yeah. About 2006, yeah. I think yeah. it was. It's still happening. You're joking. No. I thought that that had actually no. all gone still, away. It's still happening. Yeah. And again, we do, and the only way of breaking, and we've got one at the moment, she's more than happy with her tenant. The tenant loves the property. 
she is continuing to pay a fee and she has to evict the tenant and get another tenant to break the contract. And that's yeah. just so unfair to everybody. I, I think what I would say to, to you know, your member is that she needs to have a meeting with the agent hmm. and actually oh, get this yeah, she's tried rectified. That, yeah, no, I know. It's just and I would also say if they're not prepared to rectify it, then... Go to court. Yeah, yeah. go to court. Um, or, or not necessarily even go to court, change agents. Yeah. Don't go back to that agent. Because oh, that no, no. really is quite unfair and unreasonable. Oh, it it's, it's most unfair on the tenant. Yeah, definitely. Most unfair on the tenant. So yeah. they're caught in the middle. Yeah. But you know, so you know, that is something that perhaps I as an Isla can pick up and do a bit of a campaign on. I, don't oh, know. I think so. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so, you know, that's, that's something worth thinking mm. about it in the future. So you now, talking with your block management hat on, because I know you've been in block management for a, a fair time. In fact, we remember we had a discussion about it before you went into it. I think it's fair <laughs> to say it's a different animal from being a letting agent. Definitely. You're being a company secretary, really, aren't you? Yes, so. you are, yeah. Um, I mean, I hear a lot of agents say to me, oh, you do block, I'm thinking of doing mm. block. And I look at them and say to them, have you got a few years to do some training before you think about it? Mm. It is a totally different set of legislation. Mm -hmm. um, everything is very, very different. And the biggest, biggest fundamental difference is that when you are dealing with a let, then the landlord is 100% responsible, so mm. they have to make sure they get a good agent, so they're auditing the agent. Yep. When you're dealing with a block, the agent is 100% responsible, and they can get sued, and they mm. do, quite often. And that's um, a brilliant so point. That it is, so, it's, yeah. and that is the biggest fundamental thing, and this is why PI insurance is yep. often ex really expensive. Yep. You need really, really decent software. Um, you need to be able to account for every single penny. Um, you need to have special type of bank accounts known as Section 42 bank accounts, which are trust accounts. Um, the whole thing is a big game changer and it's very, very different. And I would say to anybody after going through the baptism of fire that I had um, when we went into block. Um, yeah. I remember we discussed it at yeah, the time. Yeah, 412 <laughs> units and known as the worst estate yeah. across the whole of the country and nobody would manage it and, yeah. and I took it on as a very brave person. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, I had to, I'd, I'd obviously got some experience beforehand and I'd actually been doing some training so I didn't go in completely blind so I can't be, you know, I can't be sort of taking that, that I went in um, with no experience because I, I did go in with quite a bit of experience. But you do need to get your qualifications. Yeah. Um, qualifications are a different body. They're from the IRPM, the Institute of Residential Property Managers. Okay. Excellent training with them. Um, and um, uh, and it's a very, very different field. And yes. It's really important to yes. make sure that you distinguish the two quite clearly. That's why I want to stress this so any agents watching this can you know, can be aware. Yeah. And it's one of those peculiar things where volume is, is the key. You can't do block management where you've only got a block with a few three no, properties can't. in it. You can't. Um, I mean, you know, this is another thing people think to themselves, oh, I think I'll, you know, that will be another income stream. Um, but the income stream is actually very, very low. Mm. Um, and like you said, it's like, unless you've got an estate with a decent size, um, you know, an amount of units in it, then it's not worth doing. Mm. You, you've got to actually have quite a few properties within each estate and forget the twos or threes, which most people won't manage, and that's why they're often hanging around, because nobody will manage them, because you will never, ever be able to actually cover your costs if you're actually doing the job properly by taking on these little tiny units. Mm. It's a real shame for those people that can't manage and, that, and they do need the help. So, so there is a, a, a really good organisation out there, FPRA, FOPRA, um, and they are there to help the, the small, you know, little um, like two up, two downs or just a few units and they need help with management. Right. And I would recommend anybody go to them and join them because they offer, a bit like your Landlords Association, mm -hmm. Peter, they are there to give the support, the help. Um, there's a once a year AGM, all the members are invited to come along. There's magazines, there's a helpline. You know, there's so much that they actually offer. Mm. And so for those that really are struggling to try and find a managing agent, then, you know, there is help out there in mm. regards to, to FOPRA. Mm. Um, but when it gets sort of 
above sort of 15, 20 units, you really do need to have it managed properly and, and that's where you need to be looking at uh, qualified agents to be able to get that work done. Yeah, all right, okay. Right, put a different hat on, put your councillor hat on. I know you've been councillor on a couple of different uh, local authorities. So if you were to be pure councillor, not a landlord, not a letting agent, what would your view be of, uh, uh, sorry, what would your view be of landlords and the private register as a whole and do you feel it's helped you being a landlord and being a councillor? Oh definitely, yes. Um, I mean I purposely and for conflict of interest I've never sat on planning right. um, and I don't generally get involved too much on the on that side of the business. Um, when I was, because I, I did two terms in Bexley, so I was eight years as a councillor in Bexley, and I did get involved with some of the work there where we were dealing with landlords, um, mm -hmm. but then by the time that I'd actually moved, and I'm now in the Seven Oaks Borough, um, they'd, um, they'd then started to bring in licensing when I wasn't even a councillor anymore, so I had nothing to do with that. Which I'm really pleased to say, because I don't think it's gone particularly that well. But you know, it's um, when does it? Unless you've got a huge, great big budget. And yeah. as we know, the uh, Newham had a huge, great big budget because it was at the time of the Olympics, and they yeah. were given several million by their they, government they, to be able to do. And they employed ninety more staff. They so it did. actually worked in Newham. Yeah, it really worked well. But unless you you've got that sort of money, yeah. you know, yeah. most yeah. licensing schemes, unfortunately, are not that great. Um, I think it's a good idea and I, I I'm, I'm personally for me I think that when the Housing Act 2004 started all getting enacted in 2006 it's a blooming shame that they didn't actually go a little bit further at that point because I, from what it looks like to me is most local authorities are now looking more and more at actually getting their properties licensed. Mm. But I'm not sure how they're going to do that without the huge, great, big budgets in well, place. We'll stick with that theme for the moment. Mm. Um, I know this wasn't under the Housing Act, but the, the coalition government brought in registration. Yes. Which, sorry, the Labour government brought in coalition, uh, brought in registration. The coalition got rid of it. What's your views on that? Because I've got views, and I'll tell you those in a minute. So, what's your views on that? Um, well. I t <laughs> it's um, it's a really difficult one. Um, licensing doesn't necessarily you don't necessarily need licensing mm. if you've actually got a decent kind of registration scheme in yep. place. Yep. And I think that if and I do feel quite strongly about this. That there's a lot of stuff. I don't know if you're aware of URL properties with yep. with the URL yep. numbers. Yep. And I'm absolutely all for this mm -hmm. because I think that that is the way forward. I don't think that we need to have a licensing scheme. I think licensing can actually be be, be disposed of mm -hmm. by every property having a URL, and then. With the URL, like any URL, you've got all the landlord's details, you've got the, that it's got gas cert, that it's got electric cert, that it's safe. You've got all the details, the whole lot is all there. So there isn't a need for other schemes. Mm. Plus, it would be extremely easy for the government to actually police all this anyway. Mm. And I think that if every property was like that, then it wouldn't be a huge resource on all these different... <laughs> HMO or licensing mm -hmm. schemes, which are all over the place. Mm -hmm. There's 402 uh, uh, councils across the country, and there's probably about the same amount of different licensing schemes because okay. they yeah. none of them work together. They yeah. work in silos. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I would personally like to see the URL, and I do think that that is the way that they are actually looking. Certainly, work that we're doing at I, with IRPM on the on the block side, you know, yeah. it seems that this <coughs> is the way um, that, that the government are actually looking for the future, and I do hope that that's the case. Yeah, I mean, our view is that. We think it's wrong they got rid of registration because if they kept it from the outset, we wouldn't have a lot of these licensing schemes. Mm. Um, agree with you, we've tended to call it more of a property MOT. Yes. So some kind of house register. And you must be registered to be able to, to let it. And in that register, as you say, will be, yes, I've got an EPC or not, because I might not need one. Mm. 
that's yep. another matter. But I've got my gas certificate, certificate. By the way, I got shouted at for calling it a gas certificate by a, the gas engineer I was training. <laughs> it's called a gas inspection report. It right. <laughs> <laughs> Even though we all call it a gas certificate, but there you go. And I've got my electrical certificate and everything, anything else I need, you know. Yeah. So then that's how you police it. That That's the way we are It makes pushing. sure the property is compliant and it yeah. ticks all of the yeah, boxes exactly as far as the local th yeah. authority is concerned. Yeah. So they don't have to actually like knock on someone's yeah. door and say, where's all the certificates? Yeah. And that's right. Yeah. That is right, that we should be working to yeah. a standard. We should be getting our certificates um, all in place and we should be providing good accommodation to yeah. tenants. Yeah. Uh, no, I completely agree with you. I completely agree with you. And again, we always tend to say to local authorities and central government, you really should be concentrating on the bad ones. They're yeah, called rogues, it's a horrible word, but you know, we tend to call them criminals, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. They're the ones you should concentrate on. Yeah. And those that don't really know what they're doing, well, train them. Yes. You know? yeah. So the only thing, in my view, that licensing does give the local authority or the environmental health officer is the ability to enter a property without being invited. So that's the only thing it gives them. Mm. It would be it would be primary legislation, but you know they could bring that in. So it's interesting though you, you saying all this, Peter, because actually all the legislation, as we know, is already in place yep. for local authorities, yep. and they don't need to bring no. in more legislation. No. I just wonder if some local authorities aren't actually looking at what they've already got in place yep. set in stone yep. already in legislation that they can actually use yep. right here and now yep. without actually trying to reinvent wheels well the problem is that so often licensing especially by councillors is looked upon a way of raising money uh, for instance we're just doing a battle with ealing council because they're trying to bring in licensing we reckon they're going to, they're, through their license, they're, they've got a licensing scheme already. Mm. We think they've taken about 10 million on that over five years. And we've asked them, what have you spent that on? If you spent it on the PRS, fine, not a problem. But if it's gone into other, your other coffers, then that's not fine. It, it's not allowed. No, it's not allowed. It's not allowed at all because that, that money for any money, and this is in legislation as mm. we know, any money that's actually been earmarked and paid mm. from the licensing uh, scheme has to actually be put back in, mm. ring-fenced and put back in to that same scheme, yep. whether it be staffing or whatever it is, but it, it can't be spent in other domains within mm. the council they so would. I would say probably if you are doing some work then maybe you should ask or your members from that area or, or as the association but I should ask for a freedom of information yeah, on where that's, that money has gone yeah no, that's certainly the, the mm. next step that we're considering because it's all come up quite quickly yes so but you know it is, it is interesting so um, yeah okay well that's interesting that we think along the same lines there mm. so and this is where it's useful you being a councillor or a local authority councillor mm. uh, as against counselling other people. <laughs> it's funny because both the councils that um, I've served on don't own their own stock. No, well, a lot of councils don't. No, do they? no. In Bexley, uh, they sold their stock um, to the uh, uh, private sector uh, or housing association. Probably I should in the 80s, say, yeah. I would guess. Yeah, 92, I think it was. Yeah, 92, yeah. 93. And yeah. um, uh, Seven Oaks was the same. And it's quite interesting because with the councillor hat back on, most local authorities actually wish they hadn't sold their yep. stock. The only reason they sold their stock is because they could never actually borrow against it. But yep. because legislation has changed and over the years. Uh, yep. And now most local authorities are actually now looking at being builders and developers themselves. Yep. Um, certainly in, in the council that I now serve under Seven Oaks, um, we have some valuable assets within our portfolio um, and we're looking at land and building and being able to offer tenants, you know, but uh, um, suitable accommodation, but through partners, yeah. you know, building. So we don't become the builders per se. Yeah. So we work with other partners to get the build done and then mm. we will then take it on. Um, so I think there's a, a lot better, fairer schemes that are actually out there. And it's just a shame that many years ago councils couldn't actually borrow yeah. against their stock um, because now housing associations have become extremely rich and local authorities are now kind of almost going back to yeah. where 
they should have been years ago. Well, and we're finding a lot of social landlords now are just acting as developers. They're just building to sell. Yes. They're, yeah. they're not attempting to, to do what they're supposed to be doing, yeah. which is building new properties. Um, or That's changing quite a lot, though, isn't mm. it, Peter, with the build to rent scheme? And um, there are many organisations. I noticed in the news yesterday that Lloyds Bank are actually now one of the big players. Yep. They're intending to build God yep. knows how many millions. Um, and I think the build to rent scheme is probably going to be the thing of the future. You know, yep. that's, and that kind of links hand in hand almost with IRPM and, and the block side, as well as the, the letting side on the Arla side. So there's a lot of synergies. And do you um, know another big player? IKEA. Yeah, and John Lewis. Yep. You know, yep. the, the big corporates are out yep. there and yep. they are looking at the build to rent schemes yep. Yep. Um, because there isn't enough stock. No. And so, you know, that it has to come from the private sector. Yep. And I think that it is. And, you know, we've got a huge change in landscape at the moment with what's actually going on. Yeah. And the other thing that really I think should be looked at by local and particularly central government is the definition of affordable rents. Yes. You know, this thing about it's 80% of the, the, the going rent. Well, you know, if you've only got X pounds to spend on a rent, then you've only got X pounds, regardless of what the local rent is. So, yeah. And I could get a little bit frustrated uh, with the local authorities that hate HMOs per se, because they are affordable rents. Mm. I mm. fully understand that uh, an HMO that's not properly managed is a nightmare mm. on the neighbours for everybody. But that's actually why licensing was brought in. It, it is actually why. And it's brought in. you know, so it's, this is where the local authority yeah. can use their their powers, yep. and they have a huge amount of powers, as we know. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, to be able to actually deal with with you know poor, poorly managed HMOs. You know, it's mm. like if you've got an HMO, then there's got to be somebody who's a responsible person. Yep. That responsible person has then got to take that responsibility, and if they're not doing their job properly. And they're just taking the money and um, you know not doing anything. It's down to the local authority to actually deal with it appropriately. Yep. Okay. For not only for the land or, 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 or you know not only for the tenants and for everyone else, all the neighbours and yep. everybody else, because there is nothing worse. And I have seen it so many times o over the years. You know, working in block in particular, yep. where you get somebody bad coming in, and mm. it can actually it, it can destroy people's lives. Oh. Yes. So uh, it is so important to actually make yeah. sure that HMOs in particular are well managed. And, and the thing is for landlords, agents, everybody, they must do extra due diligence before they take a tenant into an HMO. Mm -hmm. Because again we get this on the, on the helpline where um, there's one tenant in an HMO is causing problems, the other tenants start leaving, mm -hmm. so the good tenants leave. And unfortunately, it's extremely difficult if they're if they that, that one tenant's paying their rent, but just giving antisocial behaviour. Yeah. Really difficult dealing with them. Yeah. Really difficult. So we do stress, and I hopefully you know you'll back me up on this one. Do do your due diligence. If you've got a, an empty room, don't rush to get it filled. Yeah. It could cause you all sorts of trouble down the definitely, line. Definitely, definitely. I mean, it, it, it's not just HMOs, is it? it it's everything. You know, it's yeah. like. Oh, yeah. um, there are a lot of landlords out there that um, they you know, might be a friend of the family or mm. somebody suddenly pops up and they need somewhere and that friend or that family member never, it never works, it just mm. doesn't work. Um, and for that quick fix of like, you know, oh well I'm not going to have to pay an agent or oh somebody's come along so mm. I don't have to pay yep. for marketing, just, just don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> it's not worth it. No, it no, really I... isn't. It's it will be your biggest bugbear and your biggest nightmare yeah. and it can take months or possibly and, years and to get someone out. Believe it or not, sticking with that same theme, the number of times we find where that's happened and there's no written contract. Really? So it's an oral contract. Yeah. I, I'm Shocking. absolutely amazed at the number of times that happens. Yeah, and, and of again, course in legislation that's allowed. So you can actually yep. create a, a contract from yep. the law of talk, you know, offer acceptance, yep. consideration, you're giving yep. them the keys, they're giving you some money, that's it, you don't yep. need a contract. Yep. Yep. Try and go to court with it though, it's going well, to be it, very it, difficult. It, it, exactly that, I, mean, I don't know, what, when we're training, I know I say, and I think you probably say the same thing, which is um, you're trying to build up a, a, a paper chase here so that 
if you have to go to court, and generally you won't, but if you have to go to court, mm -hmm. you need to be able to prove what you said. Yeah. And if you don't start with a written contract, then you're not hiding to nothing, quite frankly. Yeah. And amazing. as I said, it's absolutely amazing. We actually got involved with the Law Society, oh, was it a very long time ago, um, in the beginning of the 2000s, where the Law Society were recommending to the government that the, all the contracts should be written. Yeah. Government turned it down. Really? Which is such a shame. Yeah. Such yeah. a shame. It was about 2004, it was about the time that the um, Housing Act came in. Yeah. So, you know, it was such a shame. So. But there's so much we could go through here, so you know, there's a huge <laughs> amount. I'm really, really grateful to you for your time on this. You're welcome. So, you know, and uh, hopefully, a lot of our, our people will take this away and you know, they'll see a lot into it. So, Maxine, thank you so much for that. Thank really you, grateful. and thank you for coming today, Peter. Thank you. Lovely to see you again. And to you. Thank you.